So let me introduce Ivan, Ivan Struchiner from the Universidade de Sao Paulo. He will continue with the talk about global solutions of Cartan's realization problem. Yeah, okay. Uh, so let me uh, thank the organizers and uh, it's, it's very good to be in Rio again. Uh, it's a pity there was no Flamengo game to go to this week, but uh, we already won everything, so... Anyways, uh, Rui, Rui, uh, Rui just uh, gave me the good part of the talk, so he gave all the definitions, and, uh, and I get to tell you the results, which is a good part. So, so I, I, I hope I can present a, a nice talk like, like Rui's was. So. Okay, so let me start with. Uh, so, so, so as as Hui was telling us, uh, Cartan data admitting solutions give rise to G-structure algebras, right? And uh, and he wrote it explicitly. So the, there was the Cartan data, and then you you could define out of these structures the bracket which uses the torsion and the curvature, and uh, and the anchor which uses the map. F, which is given in the Cartan data. Or you can view this dually as on the differentials of forms, right? So this was something that Rui explained quite a lot. And, uh, and actually, one of the things I'm going to do now in this part of the talk is, I mean, there's, there's a part which has not been shown, and this was discussed in the questions part. So, I mean, we have not shown that g structure algebras with connections give Cartan data which admit solution, right? It, it gives you the Cartan data, but with Yet, don't know yet if it admits solutions. This is one of the things I'm going to show in this part of the talk. But also, I mean, he also said kind of quickly that solutions of the Cartan problem correspond to uh, G realizations. And by a G realization, what we mean, so a G realization is a morphism, so G realization. So this is the following. So you have your G structure algebra. A over X, and it comes with a tautological form and a connection. Let's write an A here. And a, a, a G realization is a, a G structure, so B with a connection, a tautological form and a connection, and a map H. So this is a G structure, such that TP over P, there's a map H, and this is a map phi is a morphism of G structure algebra. So if you, if you start with a G structure, its tangent bundle is a G structure algebra, which, so it comes with a G action, right? It's just the action lifted to TP, and it comes with a tautological form, and it comes with a connection, and this is all the data that you need to define a G structure algebra. So it satisfies all the property. So this, this phi here, if you, if, you, if you recall, I mean, A, if you put it in canonical form using the connection and the, and the tautological form, this is just the trivial bundle with fiber Rn plus G, right? And this map is just theta comma omega. So on one component, if you take a vector, you can apply the tautological form, which takes values in Rn, and you can apply the connection form, which takes values in the Lie algebra, and saying that this is a morphism of G structure of Lie algebra. It's the same thing as saying that it satisfies these equations. Okay. So these are G realizations, and these are the solutions to the problem that we're looking for. Okay. So uh, once you once you, I mean, if if you have a a G structure groupoid which integrates your G structure algebra you automatically get solutions to your problem. And this, this goes like this. So, so if gamma over x, so it comes with a G action, and it, you also have your tautological form and your connection form, omega. So if this integrates, or I should write G integrates, your G-structure algebra A over X, so your G-structure algebra with connection, that just means that if you apply the Lie functor, you get back A, then this gives rise to a family of solutions parametrized by X, and that was kind of what 
uh, who he was hinting at, and let me kind of write this explicitly. So what happens is the following. So, I mean, Rui told us that S minus one of X over the quotient, S minus one of X mod G, G, is a G structure, right? So it is a G structure, it's tautological form, theta is just this capital theta restricted to S minus one of X, and it's, its connection form is just the restriction of omega to S minus one of X. And, but this has a very nice property. I mean, this is true for any group part. If you look at the map from T, the tangent bundle of S minus one of X, so this S minus one of X, to A, which is, it should be called the murray cartan form, and I'll write it down explicitly in a second, this covers the target map to X. This is a, always a Lie algebra morphism, right? So murray cartan form is just, you take your vector, and you right translate it back to the identity, right? So omega murray cartan applied to Xi, which is the differential of right translation. So it, if this is at a point gamma, gamma minus one of Xi, and it belongs to A at the target of gamma, right? And this is always a morphism of Lie algebroids, and in this case, it's a morphism of G structure algebroids. So it's a G realization. So what I'm saying is that if you can integrate your algebroid to a G structure groupoid with connection, then each S fiber is a realization of your problem, is a G realization, is a solution. So that's kind of, uh, that's exactly what's written here, right? And th these solutions are actually very special. So, so mori cartan forms, I mean, classical mori cartan forms on Lie groups, they satisfy a universal property, right? If you have any form with values in the Lie algebra which satisfies the mori cartan equation, it's at least locally the pullback of the mori cartan form. And these solutions also uh, satisfy a kind of universal property. So, uh, and, uh, and I'm going to talk about that uh, soon. But so, the, uh, so these solutions satisfy kind of a universal property, and we're, we're going to show that locally these are all of the solutions. Every solution is of this form locally. But first we have to deal with the integration problem. So, I mean, if we want to build solutions, we have to know if starting with a G-structure algebra, if it is integrable or not, if it is G-integrable or not, if you can find a G-structure group or with connection that integrates it. So that's the... That's the, the, the problem we want to deal with. And maybe I erase. Uh, let me leave that. Maybe I'll erase here. So the, the problem of integrating a G structure algebraoid to a G structure groupoid is the following. So you, 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 you have your, your G structure algebraoid. Let's write it A over X. And you have uh, your action morphism which was a map from the action algebra to A. And integrating this to a G, well, at least to a G principal groupoid amounts to first integrating the algebra. So you want to integrate the algebra to a groupoid. And you want to integrate this morphism to a morphism of the action groupoid to gamma, right? So, so you can see that if A is integrable as an algebra, and if G were simply connected, then this, this part would be trivial, right? I mean, if you could integrate A, then using Lee's second theorem, you could integrate the action morphism. But the problem is that G is given. I mean, G determines the geometry that you're studying. You cannot just pass to the simply connected cover of it. Right, G is ON, or G is SLN, or G is S, the symplectic group, or whatever. It depends on the geometry you're studying. And so it might not be simply connected, and then finding this morphism might be non-trivial. And that's the, 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 the problem that we have to deal with. Okay. So, uh, and then a, a comment is the following. So, if it, I mean, a, a G structure algebra is first a G principal algebra. It comes with this natural G action, but it also has a tautological form, and if it has a connection, it also has a connection form. And the integration of this extra structure, the tautological form, 
and the, and the connection form come for free, if you can integrate it as a G principal algebra, then there is a unique connection form and a unique tautological form that you can put on your group or making it, it into a G structure group. Word. And that's very simple. The reason is because these forms here are supposed to be right invariant. So they are totally determined by what they do on the algebra. Right? I mean, if you start with theta, you're one form on A with values in Rn, then you can just build theta, which is the one form, the foliated, or the right invariant foliated one form on gamma with values in Rn, just by setting theta at gamma of xi is just theta of the right translation of xi. Right? So you right translate back to the identity and you apply theta. And the same thing for a connection form. So in the, in the integrability problem, I'm going to talk about G-principal algebraids and integration of G-principal algebraids. I'm just going to forget about the G-structure, the part of the structure and the part of the connection, the tautological form and the part of the connection. That comes for free. Okay? So, so let me make a, a diagram so that we can kind of understand what's going on. Please stop me if you have any questions. So, so let's assume A is integrable. So let's, let's assume that A is integrable like usual, like it comes from a Lie group point, not necessarily a G group point, a G principal group point, just a Lie group point. So we can, we can use Lie 2, the usual Lie second theorem, to get the following. So you have x being acted by g tilde. You have a map which I'm going to call iota tilde to the Weinstein group or of A. So this is the Weinstein, the, the, the source simply connected group or group or of A. And then you have the action group or that we are interested in, which is this one. So you have x being acted by g. And there's a, a, a group board projection, a group board covering map. And what we want to find is a group board here, which I'll call gamma for now or something. Let's call it just question mark. This is what we want to find, which fits into this diagram. So it should be, I mean, it should have the same algebra board, so there should be a covering of the Weinstein group board onto it, and such that we can complete this diagram, such, such that we have this morphism. This is what we're looking for. And this suggests how to find it, right? So, I mean, th this, this covering map has as kernel exactly pi 1 of g, right, at each point. So we're going to put pi 1 of g into here, and we want to quotient out by pi 1 of g to get this group point. That's exactly what we want. So let me, uh, so assuming that uh, A is integrable, we define the extended monodromy, g monodromy, at a point to be just the image under iota tilde of pi 1 of g. And this sits inside the isotropy group at the point x inside the Weinstein group point. And uh, so this is what is the extended g monodromy. And if you put all of them together, so if you put all of these g monodromies together, this always gives you a normal sum bundle of groups contained in the center of the isotropy. So, I mean, these are the correct things to quotient out and get group board structures, but you want to get something smooth, so this needs to be discrete, right? I think this is the, the usual thing that happens. And that's the first theorem I want to present to you. So the first theorem says that uh, a, a G-principal algebra, which is integrable, is uh, G-integrable, so it comes from a G-principal group board, if and only if this... Uh, normal bundle of subgroups, the extended monodromy is uniformly discrete, or if it's an embedded zero-dimensional submanifold. Okay. And, and then what you put here is precisely, and I'm going to give it the name, sigma g of A, in this case, which is just sigma of A, so the Weinstein group board quotiented out by this uh, extended g monodromy. And this will be a group board which satisfies, fits into this, into this diagram. And this group point 
is precisely the canonical, in this, so if it is integrable, this is precisely the canonical integration appearing in Lee 1 that Rui talked about. Right? I mean, this is the, the largest quotient, so you're quotient it out by the smallest thing that you can to get a, a, a G structure group, right? If you quotient it out by something bigger, then you can compose these maps and you get this. So you still get the morphism going down, right? So this is the, the maximal integration, G integration of A. Okay, so that's what's uh, written here. So, uh, and then, as usual, you can, we want to work at the level of the Lie algebra, right? So, so you can play the usual trick, so the trick that, uh, uh, of identify, I mean, since these things lie in the center of the isotropy group, you can identify the connected component of the center of the isotropy group with the center of the Lie algebra using the exponential. And you can def define the, the G monodromy to be the group which exponentiates to the extended G monodromy. Okay. So this is the, the G monodromy. And again, A is, I mean, you, you, you can measure this on top on A. So A is integrable if and only if this uh, monodromy is uniformly discrete inside A. And actually, I mean, if, if you notice well, I, I, I removed the, the hypothesis of A being integrable when I, when I expressed this. And the reason is because the, the usual monodromy of A, which controls integrability of A, is contained inside the G monodromy. And so if the G monodromy is discrete, the usual monodromy is discrete. Right? Uh, one way that you can think about that, I mean, this is, so the, the, the isotropy groups, I mean, it, it, this is just a matter of, of checking that the, the, the kernel of the, the exponential uh, sits inside NG. And NG, I mean, NG contains the kernel of the exponential. Uh, or the opposite, I mean, the, I said the opposite thing. But one way to think about it, the, the way I like to think about it is the following. I mean, if, if you have the, the usual monodromy is controlling the isotropy groups of this guy. And the isotropy groups of this guy cover the isotropy groups of this guy. So you have to caution out by something bigger, right? So that's uh, how I like to think about it. Anyways. Uh, and, then, uh, and then, like following the ideas of Rui and Marius, we want to find a way to compute this monodromy, right? I mean, we actually want to be able to compute the obstructions for being G-integrable. And uh, to do that, uh, we can use a, sp I mean, at least, we, at least for transitive things, so restricting to the leaves, you can uh, use a splitting of the anchor, but the splitting of the anchor should be adapted to the action of G. And what this means is the following. So you have the infinitesimal action. So you have this map on G. So this includes, so the action morphism to A. Let's say A restricted to L, let's put an L here. And then you have the anchor map rho to TL. And you also have the infinitesimal, this is the map psi, right? And you want the, a splitting such that this diagram commutes, the opposite diagram commutes. So if, if, you, if you lift an infinitesimal generator of the action, it should be the infinitesimal uh, action morphism applied to the, that element. That's what's written on the bottom there. So these are the, the good splittings. And of course, the curvature should lie in the center of the isotropy Lie algebra. And that's, I mean, just to be able to, to integrate things and get local coefficients, just like in the usual integrability theorem. Okay. So, so, so if you're in this setting, then you can uh, uh, compute the G monodromy at a point by looking at integrals of the curvature of the splitting restricted to disks where the boundary of the disk lies inside the orbit. Right? And the, 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 the proof of this is very much analogous to the proof of the theorem which says that you can look at integrations of the curvature along the sphere to get the usual monodromy when you're trying to understand the integrability of, of Lie algebra. So it's, it's actually very similar. But I just want to emphasize that this is something which is computable. And at the end of the talk, I'm going to go back to the case of extreme Kähler, 
uh, matrix, and I'll, I'll at least show you the ingredients of the computation. So this is something we can compute explicitly. Okay. So, uh, so, so now I want to. Now that I, I told you the results about integrability, I want to to tell you about go back to our original problem and see how they imply results about solu existence and uniqueness of solutions to, to, the, to the Cartan realization problem. So let me just see if I didn't forget to tell you guys anything. So, so the, 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 the first result, and this is, uh, it's, it's quite non-trivial. I mean, it, it uses a lot of the, the usual integrability and, the, uh, and understanding the, the, the obstructions to, to G integrability uh, uh, quite a lot. Is that if, and a result like this, we didn't find anywhere in the literature, I mean, not even like translating it to the, to the to the actual problems, right, so to the Cartan problem. So the result says that if you start with, a, a, say, a G-structure algebra with connection, and you fix a point on the base, then you can find an invariant s neighborhood of the, orb of the G orbit of that point inside the leaf, for which the restriction of your algebra to that invariant neighborhood is G integrable. So if you restrict a small enough invariant, so saturated neighborhoods, you can G integrate your algebra. And uh, I mean, this is, so Rui said that, like, that we could uh, assume, for example, that G is compact, right? That's what we're doing. If G is not compact, this has to change a bit. You actually need slices to be able to do this. So, but now I'm assuming G to be compact. And the, the, the idea is that, if you really just restrict your algebra to a G orbit, then you can have a lot of control on the integrability of this, the G integrability, because you have a wide subalgebra, which is just the action algebra, restricted to that orbit, which is integrable. So there you have a lot of control. And then you, 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 if you take a neighborhood which retracts to that, all the topology is concentrated on this G orbit, and applying the obstructions that we found, you can find these G integrations. That's the idea of how to prove something like this. Okay. So uh, a, a consequence of this is that for every point on X, there exists, so for every point on X, there exists a solution to your problem, to your original problem, which takes that value, uh, it, so that value is in the image of H. So let's, I mean, just, I mean, you should think about this, this space X as parametrizing the possible invariance of your problem. So it parametrizes the torsion, it parametrizes the curvature, and it parametrizes differentials of these invariants. And what I'm saying is that you can actually find G structures which have those invariants, right? So this is what the, the statement is saying. And uh, I can sketch a proof of it, if you want, which is very simple now. So, so you can do the following. So you, 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 you take your algebra and you restrict it to your neighborhood where it is G integrable, right? And so for this guy, you can take the canonical integration, sigma G of A restricted to you which is a group point over U, and it comes with a source and a target map. And then you can take the tangent of S minus one of a point X in U, of the point X in U, this goes to S minus one of X. Here you have the target map. Here you have the mori cartan form. And this is a morphism of G principal algebra with connection. And now you just include into A. And so you get a morphism from this solution. So this is a G realization of A. It's a solution which takes 
x as its value if you apply it at the one x, at the identity at x. Okay. Good. And, uh, and actually, these solutions are somewhat universal. I mean, every solution of your problem locally looks like this. Right, so this is what this theorem is saying. So it's telling you that if you, if you have any other solution, then after restricting to a small enough saturated neighborhood on the total space of your bundle, or if you want after restricting to a small enough neighborhood on the base of your bundle where the, your geometry is on the orbifold, then you can uh, identify your solution with one of these locally. So there's an equivalence of G structures to one of these, if you want, or an equivalence of realizations to one of these. So this is what this is saying. And maybe I can also give you a, a sketch of how to prove such a result. I'm going to cheat a bit, but uh, so let's write sketch of proof. Sketch of proof. I'm going to cheat because I'm going to assume that P mod G, which is M, is a manifold instead of an orbifold. So that's how I'm cheating. I mean, the theorem is true in general. I'm just going to sketch a proof in this case. So if you restrict, so if you take a small enough neighborhood V inside M such that V is contractible, in, in particular it's one connected, then Lee, Lee 2, so the, let's write G Lee 2, so Lee 2 for, for the case of uh, G structure group or then G structure algebraids, will tell you that you have a morphism from the pair group or to uh, say sigma of A restricted to U over uh, U. So this is where I can in actually integrate this algebra. And, uh, and this, this is a G-structure groupoid, which is the canonical G-structure groupoid because the quotient of PU by G is, or this is V, by, by G is just V, which is, I'm, I'm assuming, to be connected, right? That was the condition which tells you that this is the canonical integration. And now every morphism from the pair group or let's call this, I don't know, phi, every morphism from the pair group or to any other group or can be written as, so phi of PQ is just phi of P, P0, phi of P0Q, and if you call this F of P, this is the map F which appears there. Is there equivalence with an S fiber of, of the other group point? So it's something which just follows from Lee's second theorem. A similar argument works in the orbifold case, but you have to be more careful. Are there any questions? So, so now I want to tell you a bit about global solutions. So this, this kind of solves, I mean, I'm, I'm going to come back to the local solutions and tell you what the moduli space of local solutions is. But this kind of settles the local solutions, right? And what I just told you is that for every point on the base X, there exists a local solution, right? There exists a solution, which might be local because, I mean, you have to restrict to, to small open sets. And, uh, and that locally, these are all of the solutions. I mean, this, this is kind of, uh, these, are, these are kind of universal in a sense, or at least versal. So, so now I want to tell you about the, the global problem, global solutions. And, uh, and to understand global solutions, we need to, I'll tell you what I mean by a complete G realization. So these are what are the global means, right? So. I guess that by now I can erase over here. So suppose that you have a, a G realization. 
to have TP, and you have a map phi, and you have a map A, and you have a map P, and you have a map H, and you have a map X. Right? So you have a G realization of a G structure algebra with connection. By the way, uh, maybe I should have said this before, but since this is a, a, a Lie algebra morphism and the domain is transitive, its image lies in a leaf, right? It's always inside a leaf. So really what, I mean, if you're really interested in just like finding solutions and finding global solutions and things like that, what will really matter is not the integrability of the, the, the algebra, but the integrability of the algebra restricted to leaves. But if, if, if you have the, integra the G integrability of the algebra, then you also have transverse information, right? Your, your group board will tell you what happens when you go from one leaf to the other. And if you only have something which is like weak integrability, so you can only integrate things along the leaves, then you lose this transverse information, which might be important, for example, in describing moduli spaces and things like that. Okay. So, so, so we have this map. And, and in fact, this map is necessarily a fiber-wise isomorphism to A, right? Because it should map the tautological form to the tautological form, the connection form to the connection form, and these give you a co-frame. So this has to be a fiber-wise isomorphism, which means that you can use it to get an action of A on P, an infinitesimal action of A on P. So you get an infinitesimal action of A on P, let's call it sigma. So this is a map from H star of A to TP, and it's uniquely characterized by the fact that if you do phi of sigma of P xi, this is just xi, right? I mean, you're just inverting the map. So this is an action, and, uh, uh, and then uh, 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 we, will, we will say that a re uh, G realization is complete if this action is complete. So actually, there's two things we should put. So we want the image of H to be an entire leaf. It could be just an open set inside the leaf. We want it to be an entire leaf. And that this action is complete in the sense that if, so complete in the sense that if xi t is a time-dependent section of A restricted to L such that rho of xi t is complete, then sigma of xi t, which is a time-dependent vector field on p, is complete. So this is what I call a complete solution. And this is actually related to completeness in the metric sense if your structure group G is a subgroup of ON. So let me try to tell you how these things are related. So maybe I put that just to not to forget to say this. But. So, so a remark is that, so if G sits inside ON, and let's say that the torsion is zero, so torsion. So this is our C of your algebra is zero. This just means that the connection that you're going to get on your realizations is the Levitch-Evita connection associated to some metric which comes from G sitting inside ON, right? So this means that, so P over M, G is def determines or metric on M, and the connection form is the Levi-Civita connection of the metric. Right. So if G sits inside the line, you, you you get a metric on M, and I'm just saying that the connection is the one that you want. Okay. So you have a G realization, and, uh, and you have one more piece of data, which is the following. So you see, A is x 
times Rn plus G canonically, right? And this has a natural fiber-wise metric, so a natural metric on this vector bundle, which just comes from the, using the canonical metric on Rn and, say, the killing metric on the Lie algebra, which is compact. It's inside of, it's a closed subgroup of ON. So, so you have a natural metric on A, and this metric, so you have a natural metric on A, which induces a metric, let's call it KL, on each leaf L. So each leaf becomes a, each leaf of your algebra becomes a Riemannian manifold. This, how do you define this? You see, if you look at A restricted to L, kernel of rho L, rho L, zero, TL, zero, then you can identify TL with the orthogonal to this subbundle. So TL identifies with kernel of rho L orthogonal. And this determines the metric on L. Right? Since say has a metric, this determines the metric on L. Okay. So, so, so this is the extra piece of data. And the result is the following. So, so P, so, the, so let's, let's write, let, let, let me write it here. So the metric on M determined by P, so by this G structure on M, is complete, so complete in the metric sense, so in the metric sense, if and only if, KL is complete and P is a complete G realization. So there's one more, I mean, if it's a complete G realization and this metric is complete, so in particular, if the leaf is compact, all you need is that this is a complete G realization. And let, let me just stress that it's usually, so I think Rui even said this, it's usually very hard to determine if you have, if you, if you have complete solutions to, in the metric sense to your realization problem. Like if you start with an actual realization problem, it's usually very hard to determine because all the techniques that were available until now were local techniques. So you could say things about the existence of local solutions and construct local solutions and things like that. But there was very little that could give you global things. And it was very hard to determine if there existed or not complete, like metrically complete solutions to your problem with the invariance that you wanted, with the prescribed invariance, taking values in the, in, the, in the leaf that you wanted. And here we can determine this in principle only using infinitesimal data. Right? Somehow all you need here is infinitesimal data to determine this. So, uh, so in principle it's doable. So the, 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 the theorem is about existence of complete and complete, I really mean di just this complete, right? Not metric complete, so complete in the sense of realizations, is that there exists a, a G realization over a leaf, which is complete in this sense, if and only if the restriction to the leaf of your algebraid is G integrable. So, so really, I mean, if you, if you want to know if there is a, metric, if you're in the case where G is inside ON and you want to know if there is a metric complete realization over a given leaf, you have to determine if this transitive G structure algebra over L is integrable or not, and we have infinitesimal obstructions for that, and you have to determine if this metric on L is complete or not. So that's what you would have to determine. Uh, and, and there's also a uniqueness result which says the following. Uh, so, so if you, so the, the, I mean, the, the way you, I mean, the way you prove that theorem, in one direction, if it is G integrable, you just take the canonical integration and that will be complete, right? The source fibers will be complete. 
In the other direction, you have to do a trick which is somehow what, uh, somewhat similar to the, to the trick you do to show that if you have a complete uh, symplectic realization of a Poisson manifold, then you have uh, an integration of it. That's the kind of trick you need to do. Okay. So, uh, so, so the uniqueness result that we have is that if, if you have a complete G realization which is one connected in the sense that the base manifold is one connected, then it is globally isomorphic to the source fiber, to the G realization coming from the source fiber of the canonical integration. So the canonical integration will give you a versal family of one connected complete realization. Every one is isomorphic to one of those. Okay. So, so let me, I'll, Maria just told me I have 10 minutes, so I'm, I'm gonna go a little bit faster. And, uh, and uh, I wanna tell you a bit about the modular space of solutions. So, so, so here we wanna understand like what are all the solutions of a Cartan problem, modulo equivalence, modulo isomorphism. And there are actually two different problems which have very different nature, right? So if you, if you wanna understand this locally, so germs of solutions, and I'll define that in a second, this has one nature, and if you wanna look at this globally, so complete solutions, this has a very different nature. So let me start with the local one. And uh, so, so a germ of a realization is just a, 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 a realization with a marked point on the base. And you say that, I mean, you, you first look at marked realization. So you look at realization with a marked point and you say that two marked realization have the same germ if you have a local equivalence between these realizations around those points. And this gives you a good notion of a germ of realization, and you can talk about isomorphisms of germs of realization and, and so on. And the, 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 the first result that we can say is that if you, if you want to understand the moduli of germs of realization, so germs of realization is up to isomorphisms of germs, then this, this moduli space or stack, if you want, is represented by the action group or of the group G on X. So what this means is, so maybe I should write down what this means. This means that for every X in X, you have a germ of realization. For every germ, every germ, every germ, is isomorphic to one of these. And the isomorphisms from the germ determined by a point X to the germ the point determined by a point Y in the base X is just the set of elements in the group which send X to Y. So this is what I mean. And then you can actually say that the, the smooth structure or whatever that you want on these germs of, of solutions, on this moduli of germs of solutions, comes from this section group, right? So, so this is what you get, and I mean, this, this should, it sounds, I, I think it should sound reasonable, because for each point in X, you can locally integrate your algebra, you take the source fiber, and it comes with a natural marked point which is just the projection down to the quotient space, S minus one of X mod G, of the identity element, right? And, uh, and all of them are locally, I mean, for, from the universal property, all of them are locally equivalent to something like this. Okay. Uh, and you see that, I mean, when you, you construct the, 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 the morphisms, it actually depends on choosing a frame on top of the marked point, and the frames differ by an element in the group G. And this is what's giving you the the group G acting from one point to the other. But, but there's something which is unsettling here, which is that the, the, the leaves of the algebra do not appear, right? I mean, we're losing some, somehow information. This, the local modular space does not see the algebra A at all. So, so what is the information that the leaves are giving us? And I can say that in two words just because I, I'm running out of time. So if, if you have two germs and you can wonder if they, there exists 
some realization which has with two different points such that one germ cor corresponds to one point and the other germ corresponds to the other point. Right? If it exists, then the two points belong to the same leaf of, of L. And if A is integrable, then the, the converse is also true. So it's telling you about if you can glue or not the germs of realizations. If you glue them into two different germs of realization. That's what the leaves of A are telling you. Okay. So the, the, the global moduli is, uh, is similarly defined. So you're looking for complete one connected G realizations modulo global isomorphisms. And if your algebroid is uh, G integrable, then this actually corresponds to the canonical integration. That's a, a group point which represents this moduli stack, the canonical integration. And the arguments are, are very similar here. So, so I mean, if you're, if you're interested in not one connected G realizations, then you have to look at quotients of these, right? Because if you pull back to the universal cover, it becomes one connected and it is a G realization. So you can say something about that. And if A is not integrable, then you can still say something, which I said before, you just restrict to the leaves in which it is integrable, G integrable, but then you lose transverse information. You, you lose the smooth information about the stack. And I don't want to talk about this now because uh, I'm running out of time. So let's, let's I'm going to kind of go really fast on these slides because I, don't, I really don't want to bother you guys with the computations. I just want to show you the kind of computations which are involved. So I have something like three minutes, right? Four minutes, okay. So, so, so I, I want to go back to the original example, which was the example of classifying extremal Kähler metrics. And then we, Rui showed us the differential analysis. We got, out of the differential analysis, we got the, the g structure algebra associated to the problem. And we want to know if, for which leaves of this g structure algebra, it is g integrable. Right, so, so which leaves, I mean, we already know that the local moduli space, we know everything about it. It's just X, which is CR plus C plus R, with the action of U1 on it, which just acts on the C component. That's the group part which represents the local moduli space of solutions of extreme Kähler met metrics on surfaces. But we want to know global information, and, uh, and so we want to figure out which, for which leaves this algebra is G integral. By the way, this algebra is integrable as an algebra, but it's not G integrable globally as a, as a G structure algebra. So, so, so for that, we need to understand the leaves and the isotropy of A to begin with. And uh, we, we, take, we do this in real components. So we rewrite what the anchor is and what the bracket is. And, uh, and the action. And if you do that, you, you look at the equations and you find two invariant functions for the foliation, for the leaf foliation. And these functions are independent almost everywhere except uh, if x, y, and u are zero, which correspond to fixed points. If you look at the, the formula for the, the bracket, it corresponds to fixed points. And so you can describe the leaves as the, as the common level sets of these two functions, right? So, so you, you look at the level sets of these functions. And if you look at the fixed points, you get certain, uh, you, you can write down what the isotropy Lie algebras are. It's uh, SO, SO3R, SL2, SL2R, uh, semi-direct product with R2, depending on the values of K. And this is, I mean, this is precisely the Lie algebra which controls a different problem, which are controlling metrics of constant curvature, but anyways. And the two-dimensional leaves are the, the, the common level sets of I1 and I2, which will be two-dimensional, right? Because your base manifold is four-dimensional, you have two functions, these are independent, so the leaves will be two-dimensional, and since the rank of your algebra is three, the isotropy will be one-dimensional, will be just R on those, okay. So you only have fixed points in two-dimensional leaves. So, so this is what I just said about the restriction to the part of the zero-dimensional leaves, and it's always G-integrable. The, the obstructions vanish uh, automatically. And we must analyze the two-dimensional leaves. So, so what we notice is that the, the, the invariant functions, the, the, the Casimirs, they, they only depend on the, 
on x squared plus y squared on the, rate, on the size of, of this. So it has this rotational symmetry. And if you use uh, the modulus of t squared as a, a variable, you, you, you can translate things into those uh, two equations. And, uh, and we, so, so for each value of c1, c2, we can view k as a parameter and try to understand things in terms of k. And depending on, uh, on c1 and c2, these, things, these curves will be open or closed and we will have topology or not, right? I mean, this is describing the leaves. So, so this will determine the, the topology. I mean, the topology is important to determine the G monodromy and the monodromy. Okay, so now I'm really gonna go faster, not to bother you guys with the details, but you see, you, you look at that cubic, you, you look at its discriminant, and then you have different behaviors according to how this cubic looks like, right? So, so, so first we see where the fixed points are, the zero dimensional leaves are, which correspond to discriminant zero and, uh, which correspond to discriminant zero. Uh, so, so in discriminant zero, you have a, a curve uh, which is pos uh, ha you have a triple root, right? So you have a triple root and you have this curve and the leaf is obtained by rotating that curve. So it's, but you have to remove the, the point where it's touching the zero axis because that's a zero dimensional leaf. So the leaf is, a is topologically a cylinder. It's a plane without a point. So that's one of the leaves. It's a plane without a point, and then you can compute pi one of the leaf, you can compute pi two of the leaf, you can compute the obstructions, and they vanish trivially, and A restricted to this leaf is G integrable. Okay. So then you have uh, the second case where, where the discriminant is zero and C2 is negative, and you have one single root and one double root, right? And I mean, the double root is just an isolated fixed point, and if you look at the single root, you get a you have to rotate it, you don't remove the point because it's part of the leaf, you get something which is topologically a plane, and the obstructions vanish. And you go on looking at each of these cases, right? So in this case, uh, you get a cylinder on one side and a plane on the other side, and for the same reasons the obstruction vanish. And, uh, and in this case, you just get a plane by rotating that side of the curve, and then finally comes the, the, let's say, interesting leaf, which are spheres, right? So here, if, so in this, the case where the discriminant is bigger than zero, you have three different roots, three single roots, and, uh, and there's a, the, the part where you have two roots, if you rotate it, you get something which is a sphere. And when you have spheres, you have problems, right? I mean, that's somehow you get topology. And so you have to look at the spheres separately, and uh, this, these are just formulas, don't, be bothered by them, but you construct, you parameterize the leaf, you construct a G-splitting, you compute the curvature, you compute out of the curvature the monodromy, you compute the G-monodromy, and you see that you get a condition where some ratio has to be rational for these to be G-integrable. So, so you really have like a disc, something which is discrete, so the le only like rational leaves are, are G-integrable and the other ones are not. And in the rest of the, the region of, R, of R4 of your, of your X, you have like continuous deformations or something like that because you have G integrability uh, for leaves nearby. So this is a, a, a list of all the extreme Euler metrics on one connected surfaces, which are complete in this sense, but not necessarily metric complete. Right? So you can actually write down what the U1 frame bundle is and you can find a list of them. And you can say a bit more, so you can tell which ones are metric complete by the procedure I explained to you, and the only ones are R2, S2, and H2, and the orbifolds, which are the weighted projective spaces. So these are the only extremal metric. They, they, they all have constant scalar curvature, so uh, uh, except for one, right? The orbifold, exactly, except for the orbifold one. And, uh, and you can say even more, I mean, you can actually construct, it's, I'll say like this, it's possible to write down explicit formulas for the metrics and construct everything explicitly because there, there are things you can do using Poisson geometry to find explicit integrations and things like that. Thank you.